Hey everyone, it's good to be back with you to be able to study a portion of God's Word, specifically the book of Philippians. I hope that you were able to join us last week as we begun an introduction to the book, as we were looking in Acts chapter 16 to uh, see where the Apostle Paul established the church at Philippi. And we'll get uh, to those thoughts in just a moment. We want to make sure that everyone keeps abreast of all that is going on. So please, uh, we'll, we won't go through the announcements again. Just look at the, uh, at the letter that uh, the elders are putting out every Wednesday. Uh, that can be found on the church's Facebook page, also in an email that, that Ellen is sending out. So we won't go through all those announcements again. But we're grateful that you've uh, tuned in, and we hope that this study of the book of Philippians will be beneficial to us all. So before we begin, let us uh, go to God in a word of prayer. Our God, we're so grateful for the gift of Jesus Christ, and in him all things are possible, all things that pertain to your will. And Father, we pray that it will be our life's goal to, uh, to work out your will in our lives that you may be glorified. Father, at this time of, uh, of isolation, of detention, we pray your blessings upon us. We pray that we'll find the good in this situation, that, that we'll continue to uh, shine forth your will in, in our lives, that we'll continue to teach and preach the gospel. We pray that, uh, that everything that is done will be according to your will. And Father, bless us this hour as we study your word. We pray that the things that we study we'll be able to retain in our minds and in our hearts that we might be pleasing to you. Continue to be with us, forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You'll recall last time that we started in Acts chapter 16, and I invite your attention uh, to that chapter quickly uh, as we finish our introduction to the book of Philippians. You'll recall that the Apostle Paul was in a boat. He was on his second missionary journey with Silas, and they were going into Europe. The gospel was going into Europe for the first time, specifically Macedonia, where they uh, had received the Macedonian call from God to go over and to help the people that are in Macedonia. And the first place that the gospel was preached in Macedonia was a place called Philippi, and Paul and Silas entered this city and they saw uh, women worshiping uh, by the river, praying, as was custom to do on the Sabbath day. And so this is what these ladies were doing and were introduced to those events here in Acts chapter 16. And um, Paul and Silas, as they were taking the gospel, were being followed by a girl who was demon-possessed, and she was working uh, for some uh, men, and she was making them money by fortune-telling, by being a soothsayer. And what she would do is say that uh, these men, Paul and Silas, were coming in the name of the Lord, they were bringing salvation, and attached to that announcement was her uh, being involved in these kinds of uh, nuances and uh, being involved in soothsaying. So uh, after a while, the Apostle Paul had about enough of it, and so he cast the demon out of this girl, and when she had stopped doing her thing, the men that were making money off of her got upset and threw Paul and Silas in prison. Well, instead of taking a worldly approach to that, or to put the, focuses, uh, the focus on their position, they began to glorify God. And the Lord was working through this situation and through Paul and Silas in this Roman prison to bring about the conversion of souls and the establishment of the church in Philippi. And we saw how... Um, how Lydia was converted before this time, and then uh, Paul and Silas are placed in prison, and there was a great earthquake. And we pick up with the narrative at verse 26 that that earthquake 
was uh, of such magnitude that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Well, upon receiving that knowledge, one would think that there was a, a mass escape, that everybody had left. And verse 27 says, the keeper of the prison awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Uh, if the prisoners would have escaped, his life would have been required. He would have been responsible for that. And so he thought that he would just end it all by killing himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm. We're all here. Nobody left. I always wondered why nobody left. Do you suppose that that was miraculous? You would think that when the prison doors were opened, there was a great earthquake. The last thing you would do is just sit there. You would, you would, be, uh, you would be running. You would be looking for cover. But they were all there. And verse 29 says, he, uh, he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The greatest question that one could ask, the greatest question in all the world, the greatest question when all is said and done, that's the only question that's going to matter, have I been saved? What must I do to be saved? Those on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 asked the same question. And Peter told them on that occasion to repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. And so here in Acts chapter 16, as the church is beginning in Philippi, as the first converts were being added to the church, after this great earthquake in prison, a Roman prison guard, no doubt hearing Paul and Silas speak and sing, singing hymns to God, wanted to know what did he need to do to be saved. He was getting ready to kill himself. He was getting ready to experience death. But now he was going to be able to experience life spiritually in a great way. It's going to change his thinking. It's going to change his life. And won't it be wonderful one day to be allowed to speak with the Philippian jailer and uh, get maybe more of the details of this situation if, uh, if the Lord would allow and if that would be a significant thing to us at that point. So they, Paul and Silas, said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. I wonder how the jailer knew to ask the question about what to do to be saved. And then when getting this answer, I wonder what he thought. What was going through his mind when he was told to believe with all of his household. Well, no doubt, uh, Paul and Silas told him what to do to be saved because in verse 32, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. No doubt his house was there at the prison. That's where he was staying. That's where his family was. Not in confinement, but in that same edifice. And so the gospel is being preached to them. He starts out his sermon. He's, he's teaching from the general to the specific. Folks, it's so important when studying your Bible, studying any subject, to understand that subject generally first and then get to the specifics, the pinpoint specifics, after we've got a good knowledge of the general context of what is going on. That's why we're studying this chapter before we study the book of Philippians. The jailer knew he had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But at this point, he didn't know what all that meant to believe in Jesus. So obviously it was more than just a mental assent to the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. That was part of it. In fact, we see where that is an integral part of salvation uh, no matter where we turn in the Bible, belief is always coupled with obedience. And that's what faith is. It's a trust in our Lord and Savior, and it's obeying his will. 
Well, that's what the jailer wanted to do. And so when they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all in his house, notice what happened. The jailer was, was, was repenting of his sins. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes where they had been beaten because they were teaching the gospel uh, there in Philippi. And the Bible says immediately, immediately something happened. It was not to be put off. It wasn't to be put off for a convenient time. It wasn't to be put off until more people decided to do this. But what happened immediately? It reminds us of what happened to the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Do you remember when Philip was preaching him the gospel in the chariot? The Bible says that Philip preached unto him Jesus. It was in a general way. He was told to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But then from the general, it got down to the specific. And we weren't told everything that, that Philip told the eunuch. But he preached unto him Jesus, and the very next response from the eunuch was, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Immediately, Philip commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him immediately. Didn't wait. Because baptism plays a, a, a very significant role in one's salvation. In fact, what Jesus told Nicodemus, he couldn't go to heaven. He couldn't see the kingdom of God without being born of the water and of the spirit. Well, the same kind of situation is happening here as well. Immediately when the jailer believed that Jesus Christ was the son of God, he, he got Paul and Silas, washed their stripes, and was baptized right then and there. Now, there is something else that's significant before this uh, conversion account ends. Watch this. Paul and Silas took him from the general to the specific, and then they're going to, as it were, rehearse what was done. And we're going to have a definition of what it means to believe in Jesus. Look down in verse 34. When he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced. Now watch this. Having believed in God with all his household. His belief was not complete until he was baptized. His faith was not complete until he was baptized. Notice after he was baptized, the Bible teaches that he had believed. Having believed. When? After he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. After he repented of his sins. After he was baptized into Christ for the remission of those sins, having believed, having his faith demonstrated, having trusted, having obeyed, and all his household. What an interesting, interesting conclusion this is to the story in contrast to those that will come to this text and just read verse 31 and say, see, all you need to do is acknowledge Jesus and ask him into your heart as your Savior. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, what does that belief entail? We see what it entails in verse 33, and then he believed. And that is what correlates with Scripture. That's how James 2, in uh, faith without works being dead, corresponds to this idea of being baptized and still being saved by faith, by grace, and by any number of things. I'm grateful that the church at Philippi was started just this way, because if the church is going to be perpetuated in our world, we need to understand this context of how the church at Philippi began. Okay, so we turn now over to the book of Philippians Itself. And remember, Paul and Silas were in this Roman jail, but this was not the time that Paul wrote the letter to Philippi. These events, the beginning of the church at Philippi, happened on Paul's second missionary journey. When Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he was in a Roman prison, but 
This was after his missionary journeys or during the last one uh, when he was in Rome. So during all of Paul's missionary uh, occurrences from the time that the church of Philippi began until the end of his life, Paul was in constant uh, correspondence with Philippi, and they were great supporters of his work, supporting him monetarily and supporting him spiritually. Uh, and he wanted to write them, as it were, a thank you note, a thank you letter from a Roman prison, from detention, isolation. And he writes this thank you note to the believers for all of this help in his hours of need. And he uses this occasion to send along some instruction relative to how they were to live for Christian unity. And that comes by living as Christ would, having the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, 5. And he's going to instruct them how to remain faithful. His central thought is simple. Here in this book, only in Christ are real unity and joy possible. Only in Christ. With Christ as our model of humility, of service, of faithfulness, of unity, we can enjoy oneness of purpose with him. We can truly learn, learn whatever state we're in, in prison, in isolation because of a virus, whatever, whatever state we are in, we can rejoice evermore, always. This is a truth which Paul will illustrate and did illustrate with his whole life. And this is what keeps him in a good conscience toward God. Um, to stand fast. He's exhorting the church here at Philippi and us today to rejoice in the Lord always in everything by prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. And there are all of these short little pithy sayings that we have memorized, that we know, and that we hide in our hearts in order for us to make it through turbulent times. And if we do, we can know that the peace of God that passes all understanding, most people don't understand why we are in isolation now. They really don't get the meaning of this. They are discouraged. Some are really losing it. Some are wondering what's going to happen economically. And they cannot maintain a sense of contentment. They don't understand what the will of the Lord is. Listen, folks, our time in detention. Can, can you imagine this time that, that we are separated one from another? This is just a blurb on the radar screen. We are going to be together forever in heaven. It doesn't just last through this life. Now, those that have no hope, those that don't have that joy down deep in their heart, those that don't have this understanding from the word of God, then they cannot be content. In fact, they are usually discontent in whatever, in whatever state they find themselves. Nothing of this life can ultimately satisfy. And so Paul is giving the Philippians and us this instruction how to make it through when we are apart. Whether it's being apart because we're taking the gospel to different parts of the world, whether we are apart because of a virus, whether we are apart for whatever reason, Paul, Paul's love did not diminish because he was away from his beloved brethren here. And neither should ours. I hope that the love and the peace that we have in Christ is not being uh, compromised because we are apart. You see, Paul is trying to tell us that this peace that surpasses all understanding, watch this, will guard our hearts and minds, but only in one place, in Christ, through Christ, by Christ. That's how it comes. 
That's how Jesus could be separated when he died on the cross, even separated from his father and still love his father supremely, still love us supremely. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Paul starts out this first chapter by saying, we can be content in whatever state we're in. We can have this joy. We can have the same purpose and the same mind of Jesus Christ if we realize that Christ is our life. Now, I know that those can be words recited and not necessarily spiritual principles that are that are applied internally, spiritually. The key verse of this first chapter is verse 21. You know it well. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. For Paul to live was not himself. For Paul to live was not what anybody else thought or for anybody else. Yes, he was an amazing servant of everyone else, but he realized beyond all else, it wasn't just the people. The people were a, a very significant part of the equation, but only because God says serve those people and love those people. Make the choice to do that. So his desire, his will was uh, put on the back burner, so to speak, and for him to live was Christ, even in isolation in prison, even in shipwreck on the sea, even in battle with the enemy, spiritually speaking. Whatever he was doing, whatever, however he was living, to him, this was Christ. And if that is Christ, if whatever we do is Christ, that puts everything in which we're involved into a different perspective. It may not be a glamorous situation in which we find ourselves, but you know what? It's still living as Christ. I am to look for what Christ wants from me in those situations. Paul was a master at that, and that's why he said, whatever state I am, watch this now. Sometimes we leave this out. I have learned it's a spiritual thing. It's a mental thing. I have learned to be content. It's not something that happens naturally because how does a baby react? All the external circumstances have to be just right in order for a smile to be put on that baby's face. You get him a little uncomfortable, then he's going to look for something around him or a place to go where he thinks, ah, I'm going to like that. I'm going to like this. As we grow in Christ, we have to put the bottle away. We cannot continue to think like that. We have to exercise our mind, our spirit to say, hey, in this less than desirable physical circumstance, I am going to glorify Christ if I'm not living for me. If for me to live is Christ, then that's how I think. And then the right reaction will come. Paul and Silas physically didn't want to be in that prison. They didn't want to be in isolation. Jesus didn't want to be on that cross. From a human standpoint, Father, let this cup pass from me. Paul will write to his brethren here in this book, I know that God is going to use my change to the furtherance of the gospel, but I long to see you. I want out of here. But if God in his providence means I have to stay here to write four books of the New Testament, which the world, the church will be blessed with for centuries until the Lord comes again, then God, your will be done. And Jesus had that same mindset before going to the cross. And that's what Paul means by saying, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind? The mind of humility that I'm not living for myself. I'm living for Jesus. And that I'm going to be humble in that. And as was said about Jesus' mind, that he humbled himself even to the death on a cross. But we see what happened after 
the Lord left that isolation. We see what happened to Paul and Silas after they left that isolation. God used that isolation to a greater good. It's not all about me and my comfort. And boy, that's a hard message to get across to 21st century America, isn't it? It's difficult. Chapter 1. We can be content. We can have the mind of Christ if we understand that Christ is our life. So, the chapter begins by saying that Paul and Timothy, the bond servants of Jesus Christ, the willing servants of Jesus Christ, in their mind, and at this point, literally in, in body, but in their minds, they've given their minds over to the master, and they were servants. And he's writing, and it's interesting that Paul is writing that Timothy is with him. This isn't the only letter that uh, mentions Timothy at the beginning, that this letter is from Paul and Timothy, whether it's the, the writing uh, or the sending, Timothy is there. The books of 2 Corinthians and Colossians, uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Philemon, it's Paul and Timothy are writing, sending, having something to do with the transmission of the Holy Spirit's will to, to the church, to these Christians. And he addresses this to all the saints in Christ Jesus. There aren't any saints that aren't in Christ Jesus. We've seen from one New Testament example how one, the Philippian jailer, was initiated into Christ Jesus, and all people are initiated into Christ Jesus if they are in Christ Jesus the same way. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, notice the simple church government now, with all the bishops and deacons. Notice a couple of things here. No other church officer mentioned here. And there are no other church officers mentioned in any other part of the New Testament, but yet we have so many different offices in the hierarchy of uh, religious groups whether they be popes or cardinals or a misunderstanding of what a pastor is. A pastor is simply an overseer, and there were a multiplicity of, of those men in, in these offices. But it's something else is interesting here. As Paul is writing this letter to the church at Philippi, he includes all the saints, comma, included in all the saints are the bishops and deacons. This letter wasn't just sent to the elders, to the bishops, or just to the deacons, or just to that group, and that they were going to speak in some kind of hierarchical, ex-cathedra kind of way, as many religious groups do. In other words, the church does not establish doctrine. I wonder where it ever came from when people say, well, what does this church believe? What does so-and-so church teach? You know, when people ask me, what does the church of Christ teach? What does the church of Christ believe? I am more than happy to answer that question, but I want to make sure they understand in their mind, unlike Roman Catholicism, the church didn't give us the word of God. The church didn't give us the Bible. God gave us the Bible it's up to the church, it's up to saints, to priests, the priesthood of all believers. It's up to Christians, it's up to the disciples. It is up to us as individuals to understand the word of God. No one is to do that for us. Now, plenty of people can help us, they can be tools, but men are fallible. There is no substitute for Christ in that when someone speaks spiritually, they speak inerrantly. There is no condition like that seen in the New Testament. But this letter that Paul was writing to Philippi, he was writing to all the saints, and all the saints included the bishops and the deacons. And all were under the responsibility of understanding the doctrine not originating with the church, but the doctrine that 
originated with God and was sent to the church through divinely, miraculously inspired men to write it down. He continues by saying, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, grace is a type of unmerited favor, but the definition of that doesn't end there. We find in the Bible where grace teaches us. We find in the Bible different things about grace. Jesus was full of it. Remember, he was full of grace and truth. Uh, grace was seen in the Old Testament with Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord because he faithfully served and obeyed God. Uh, we, we learn from grace. We continue in grace. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, we are saved by grace. We are edified by the word of grace. We sing and speak with grace. Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.18 and 19, and so many other things we read about as those things are correlated with grace. When I think about grace, I think about forgiveness. I think about what Jesus did on the cross. I think about the plan of, sal of salvation. So grace isn't one of these words with a specific definition. It is more general in nature. There is an umbrella of grace, which many things reside under that umbrella. And an umbrella is an interesting illustration to use because how much do we need grace, especially when we're using an umbrella? In times of the storm, in times of danger, the grace of God comes teaching us. The grace of God wraps us up in his unmerited favor that we find only in Jesus Christ. Grace to you. This kind of, uh, these kinds of blessings be to you, but not only grace, but peace. Beloved, don't think that the peace of the Bible is something just from a physical standpoint. In fact, that's not where the emphasis lies with peace in the Bible. The peace of the Bible, yes, is an inner peace, but it's not necessarily affiliated with physical things. You know, a lot of people feel at peace when there's no turmoil. A lot of people feel at peace, and so we should, and a lot of people feel at peace because they have a lot of money in the bank account. And a lot of people feel at peace because they have a lot of food in the refrigerator. A lot of people feel at peace because there's no arguing going on. Or it's calm, you know, out in the forest on a, on a bright sunny day, much like today. When they uh, hear the babbling brook, the stream, the water across the rocks, and, and they have a peaceful... That's not the peace that the Lord is talking about. This peace that Paul is wanting the Philippians to have is not from a physical standpoint. Many people believe, well, since I have this kind of physical peace, God must be blessing me. God can bless that way, but because one experiences those things, there's only a limited blessing to that and only a temporary peace that comes through those things. The peace that the Bible is talking about is the peace that passes all these things. Peace that passes the understanding of or our limited understanding of things and how they work and how we're to use them. This peace, we do not need to confuse real spiritual peace by thinking that it always brings a worldly peace. In fact, usually it does not. When you think of the Lord's life, when you think of the Apostle Paul's life or the Apostle Peter or John the Baptist or Jeremiah or Moses or David, would you say that their life was mainly characteristic of tranquility? Even Jesus being called the Prince of Peace, he's not talking about peace of this world. He's talking about exactly what Paul is trying to get across to us, what real peace is, 
what real unity is, what real blessings are. Yes, there's a temporary blessing to these physical things, but only to be used for a greater end. This is the peace that is being spoken of in Scripture. Sometimes when we sing the song, peace, perfect peace, in this great world of sin, what kind of peace are we talking? What are, uh, you know, I hope that the author had the right kind of peace in mind, but what are we, what are we thinking when we're singing that? Peace, perfect peace, in this great world of sin. Are we thinking about just a non-battle? No problems? Oh, you know, just get me away from any turmoil? No, the Bible teaches that God's not going to take away the turmoil. He's not going to take away the battle. The battle belongs to the Lord, but it's a battle nonetheless. We need to put on the whole armor, but that doesn't preclude or compromise peace. Because, listen, war, physical war, compromises physical peace. But spiritual war... Spiritual warfare does not compromise spiritual peace. I can still be at peace and be at war. I can have this calm, calculated confidence knowing that I'm on the Lord's side. Who is on the Lord's side? When I know that, then I have this peace that the Bible talks about. So let's never confuse spiritual peace with carnal peace. And he's extending this grace and peace to the saints because those are the only ones that can have this peace. And that's why Paul would say in Romans 8, all things work together for good. They're going to bring about a peace. They're going to bring about a connection between God and man that will enable us to conquer all of these things in life that want to compromise physical peace. So this kind of peace, this kind of grace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, now remember, the theme of the first chapter is Christ is our life. If Christ is our life and for me to live as Christ, how do I do that? Number one, verse number three, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. How many times do we go to God in prayer every time we think of a blessing? Every time we think of a brother? Now, that would be utterly impossible, wouldn't it? And I don't think when Paul is saying every time he remembered somebody, he automatically went in prayer. But you know what? I bet he did it a lot more often than we do it. And you know, it doesn't take long to utter a prayer, right? As someone said before, don't know who to give credit to, but a prayer does not have to be eternal to be immortal. It can be five words, but it can be formulated to the Father, and it can be sincere and heartfelt. And we can thank our God upon every remembrance of the faithfulness of our brother. Many times, I wonder how many times, comparatively speaking, we pray for those who are not faithful, and we should never diminish that fact. We need to continue to doing that. But don't you think perhaps we pray more for those who we think need it instead of those who we think may not need it as much? Paul wasn't in that mindset. Paul thanked his God upon, and that's how if, if it's not uh, we that live, but Christ lives in us, that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to be thankful and we're going to be praying for one another. And as Paul was, even during times of imprisonment, of isolation, always in every prayer of mine. Now, that can be more literal. Every prayer that he does utter he makes request uh, for, for them and the joy that he has. And that's even somewhat difficult. Can you imagine praying for someone or a group of people every time you pray? <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? But that's what, that's what he did in order to show how 
to live as Christ. But he made request and he gave thanksgiving for the fact of their fellowship, of their koinonia, of their joint participation. Participation that he had with his brethren, not like anything he experienced with anybody and any of his friends in the world. This is a different kind of thing. This is a spiritual, eternal fellowship, and it should be emphasized as such. And along with that, in verse 6, he was confident of the providence of God. Look what he says. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until it comes time to see the Lord, God has started a work, and he's going to see it through. He was in isolation. He's going to say, I know that God is working in these chains for me to live as Christ. And even though I don't like this physical situation I'm in, I know this is Christ. I know Christ has a purpose for this. And I hope that this is the message that we're getting across to people during times of isolation. Quit sharing in their woe is me complex and show them what it means to live as Christ. Show them and tell them all the good... Tell them about all of the phone calls that you're making. Tell them about all of the ways you are able to overcome physical hurdles for the greater spiritual good. That's what people need to hear from us. And that's what it means to live as Christ. And Christ, who's begun a good work in us from the time that we were baptized into Christ, will see that good work. Yeah, guess what there's going to be? Hills and valleys. There's going to be victories and sins. But you know what? When we hit in the valley of sin, we don't stay there. We get out. We get out and we go in the right direction. And God, who's can, who started this work in us when we obeyed the gospel, he's going to see it through to the end of Jesus Christ. Do you have confidence in that? If you do, then guess what? When you're in the valley, when you're in not so desirable circumstances, Christ is still living in you. You still have the responsibility of shining the light of Christ. And we can do this with the encouragement of each other and with a book like Philippians to guide our lives and to guide our minds. He goes on to say in verse 7, and here's, here's how he applies it personally. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, it is right for us to think that God is going to complete the work in our brethren. It is right to think that we are going to be together one day. It is right to encourage each other that the crown of righteousness is laid up for us who have finished the race faithfully. And it's right for us to think that the providence of God applies to each and every one of us. Just as it is right for me to think, of the, uh, think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, the biblical heart, the mind, the spirit, our human spirits. It was in Paul's spirit. It wasn't just a physical uh, kind of, of consideration. It was in him where the joy was. And this is what brought the joy because in his spirit, he had exercised that mind to think, to have the mind of Christ. Verse 5 of chapter 2. And so he says, even these chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of me in this. In other words, we're all bond servants. We just all have a different way of servitude. But we are all disciples. We are all Christians. We are all priests. We are all saints. And we've all been separated, sanctified to this mindset of living as Christ. Well, if I'm going to live as Christ, I have to think as Christ. And I've got to think as Christ. And as Paul, as Paul did that, I'm to emulate Paul. As he thought in isolation, so we must. As he thought during times of trouble, no matter what that trouble was, and he experienced a lot. Then what? Let this mind be in you also, which was in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 8, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He told the Romans the same thing. He's always longing after his brethren. But you know, I bet the longing was a little deeper when he was in isolation. Sound familiar? I can't wait for us to get back together. I hope, 
I hope that during this time of confinement, we all are thinking about what a gathering that will be. That first Lord's Day when we're back together, uh, we need to have a reunion Sunday, and we need to be thinking now. Why don't you uh, s send me some... Um, uh, some examples of what we can do when we get back together. That could be a great day. I hope that that day is elongated for us. I hope that that will be one of the most memorable days of our whole lives here on this earth. And perhaps one great day, if the Lord allows. He'll allow us to think of that day and say, remember that reunion you had after that virus? Tell me how that reunion compares to the reunion now as we serve our Lord for eternity. This was the mind of Paul, the mind of Christ. They were able to endure much more than they thought they would be able to endure because they were living as Christ. They were thinking as Christ. Christ in his whole ministry had heaven and getting us there in his mind. That's all that mattered. For me to live is Christ. Chapter 1 of Philippians is a fantastic chapter to get us to think that way. He says, for God is my witness. I long for you like that, and I pray that your love may abound still more and more. This is another point of how do we live as Christ. Our love must abound more and more. It grows. We grow in, in, in love and in knowledge. We add the Christian graces to our lives. If these things be in you and abound, you won't be fruitless. You won't be lacking. You will be right where you need to be for God to work in you. Things that are, verse 10, excellent. Approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere. See, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's an inward thing. It's not just an outward sign. But it's something that is a part of our makeup. This is who we really are. And we will be able to serve sincerely without offense till the day of Christ. And what's going to be characteristic of us? Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Do you think that has anything to do with the Christian graces? Do you think that that has anything to do with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, which Lord willing, if we're back together in the summer, we'll be, we'll be discussing. Be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise, here it is, of God. That's what living as Christ means. That's what it means to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross daily. See, it's a daily thing. It's a daily commitment that, Lord, this day, give me the strength and the zeal to not live for me. But let me, like the Apostle Paul, to truly be able to see how I need to live as Christ, as these verses in Philippians chapter 1 tell us. Give me the wisdom to understand that my life is just a blurb on the eternal radar screen. That this truly is like a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Young people hear it. It goes by quick. It goes by quickly. Remember what it means to live as Christ when you're young. That's why the imperative from Scripture is, is remember your Creator in, your day, in the day of your youth. Youth, let no men despise it. Don't let anybody despise your youth. How does that happen? By not living faithfully in Christ. Realizing that we need to redeem the time because it is short. And you just have a little bit of time to influence people for the gospel. Perhaps just during this lesson, maybe you are ready to recommit to do that, to truly live as Christ. Make sure that whatever you do in life has at least an indirect connection back to Jesus Christ, and you will see a return for your life. Wouldn't it be a tragedy to get to the end of, of life and, and to look back and see there are many connections between my life and living for God and telling others about him and trying to bring others to him? No, Paul would not live like that. And that's why he could leave this earth very confidently for 
for him to live truly was Christ. Thanks for tuning in. Well, tuning in, I guess you're not using a television. See, when I was growing up, you always tuned in. Thanks for uh, pushing a button to come in. And I hope that you'll continue to do this on Wednesday evenings as we go through the book of Philippians. We'll begin, Lord willing, with verse 12 uh, of chapter 1 next time. Uh, stay in touch with each other. Uh, if there is anything that I can do to be of service to you, let me know that. It seems like most that I call uh, have things taken care of, but uh, surely there's something you can think of. The elders stand ready to assist in others, and, and we want to be together as much as possible. We're going to glorify God through all of this, and we're truly going to live as Christ. And my prayer is that this will be over soon. But we need to take confidence in the fact that God is using this for many blessings. I'm going to have preaching material for, for 10 years after this is over. When we truly, uh, during this time, count our blessings and name them one by one, just like Paul did in his chains. A Philippian jailer was converted. How many are going to be converted because of our imprisonment? Maybe we'll talk about it on the great reunion day, and I hope that comes very soon. Thank you, love you all, and we will uh, we'll be back with you shortly.